chapter six part one of winds of doctrine studies in contemporary opinion by george santayana this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six the genteel tradition in american philosophy part one address delivered before the philosophical union of the university of california august twenty fifth nineteen eleven ladies and gentlemen the privilege of addressing you to-day is very welcome to me not merely for the honour of it which is great nor for the pleasures of travel which are many when it is california that one is visiting for the first time but also because there is something i have long wanted to say which this occasion seems particularly favourable for saying america is still a young country and this part of it is especially so and it would have been nothing extraordinary if in this young country material preoccupations had altogether absorbed people's minds and they had been too much engrossed in living to reflect upon life or to have any philosophy the opposite however is the case not only have you already found time to philosophize in california as your society proves but the eastern colonists from the very beginning were a sophisticated race as much as in clearing the land and fighting the indians they were occupied as they expressed it in wrestling with the lord the country was new but the race was tried chastened and full of solemn memories it was an old wine in new bottles and america did not have to wait for its present universities with their departments of academic philosophy in order to possess a living philosophy to have a distinct vision of the universe and definite convictions about human destiny now this situation is a singular and remarkable one and has many consequences not all of which are equally fortunate america is a young country with an old mentality it has enjoyed the advantages of a child carefully brought up and thoroughly indoctrinated it has been a wise child but a wise child an old head on young shoulders always has a comic and an unpromising side the wisdom is a little thin and verbal not aware of its full meaning and grounds and physical and emotional growth may be stunted by it or even deranged or when the child is too vigorous for that he will develop a fresh mentality of his own out of his observations and actual instincts and this fresh mentality will interfere with the traditional mentality and tend to reduce it to something perfunctory conventional and perhaps secretly despised a philosophy is not genuine unless it inspires and expresses the life of those who cherish it i do not think the hereditary philosophy of america has done much to atrophy the natural activities of the inhabitants the wise child has not missed the joys of youth or of manhood but what has happened is that the hereditary philosophy has grown stale and that the academic philosophy afterwards developed has caught the stale odour from it america is not simply as i said a moment ago a young country with an old mentality it is a country with two mentalities one a survival of the beliefs and standards of the fathers the other an expression of the instincts practice and discoveries of the younger generations in all the higher things of the mind in religion in literature in the moral emotions it is the hereditary spirit that still prevails so much so that mr bernard shaw finds that america is a hundred years behind the times the truth is that one half of the american mind that not occupied intensely in practical affairs has remained i will not say high and dry but slightly becalmed it has floated gently in the backwater while alongside in invention and industry and social organization the other half of the mind was leaping down a sort of niagara rapids this division may be found symbolized in american architecture a neat reproduction of the colonial mansion with some modern comforts introduced surreptitiously stands beside the skyscraper the american will inhabits the skyscraper the american intellect inhabits the colonial mansion the one is the sphere of the american man the other at least predominantly of the american woman the one is all aggressive enterprise the other is all genteel tradition now 
with your permission i should like to analyse more fully how this interesting situation has arisen how it is qualified and whither it tends and in the first place we should remember what precisely that philosophy was which the first settlers brought with them into the country in strictness there was more than one but we may confine our attention to what i will call calvinism since it is on this that the current academic philosophy has been grafted i do not mean exactly the calvinism of calvin or even of jonathan edwards for in their systems there was much that was not pure philosophy but rather faith in the externals and history of revelation jewish and christian revelation was interpreted by these men however in the spirit of a particular philosophy which might have arisen under any sky and been associated with any other religion as well as with protestant christianity in fact the philosophical principle of calvinism appears also in the koran in spinoza and in cardinal newman and persons with no very distinctive christian belief like carlyle or like professor royce may be nevertheless philosophically perfect calvinists calvinism taken in this sense is an expression of the agonized conscience it is a view of the world which an agonized conscience readily embraces if it takes itself seriously as being agonized of course it must calvinism essentially asserts three things that sin exists that sin is punished and that it is beautiful that sin should exist to be punished the heart of the calvinist is therefore divided between tragic concern at his own miserable condition and tragic exultation about the universe at large he oscillates between a profound abasement and a paradoxical elation of the spirit to be a calvinist philosophically is to feel a fierce pleasure in the existence of misery especially of one's own in that this misery seems to manifest the fact that the absolute is irresponsible or infinite or holy human nature it feels is totally depraved to have the instincts and motive that we necessarily have is a great scandal and we must suffer for it but that scandal is requisite since otherwise the serious importance of being as we ought to be would not have been vindicated to those of us who have not an agonized conscience this system may seem fantastic and even unintelligible yet it is logically and intently thought out from its emotional premises it can take permanent possession of a deep mind here and there and under certain conditions it can become epidemic imagine for instance a small nation with an intense vitality but on the verge of ruin ecstatic and distressful having a strict and minute code of laws that paints life in sharp and violent chiaroscuro all pure righteousness and black abominations and exaggerating the consequences of both perhaps to infinity such a people were the jews after the exile and again the early protestants if such a people is philosophical at all it will not improbably be calvinistic even in the early american communities many of these conditions were fulfilled the nation was small and isolated it lived under pressure and constant trial it was acquainted with but a small range of goods and evils vigilance over conduct and an absolute demand for personal integrity were not merely traditional things but things that practical sages like franklin and washington recommended to their countrymen because they were virtues that justified themselves visibly by their fruits but soon these happy results themselves helped to relax the pressure of external circumstances and indirectly the pressure of the agonized conscience within the nation became numerous it ceased to be either ecstatic or distressful the high social morality which on the whole it preserved took another colour people remained honest and helpful out of good sense and good will rather than out of scrupulous adherence to any fixed principles they retained their instinct for order and often created order with surprising quickness but the sanctity of law to be obeyed for its own sake began to escape them it seemed too unpractical a notion and not quite serious in fact the second and native-born american mentality began to take shape the sense of sin totally evaporated nature in the words of emerson was all beauty and commodity and while operating on it laboriously and drawing quick returns the american began to drink in inspiration from it aesthetically 
at the same time in so broad a continent he had elbow-room his neighbours helped more than they hindered him he wished their number to increase goodwill became the great american virtue and a passion arose for counting heads and square miles and cubic feet and minutes saved as if there had been anything to save them for how strange to the american now that saying of jonathan edwards that men are naturally god's enemies yet that is an axiom to any intelligent calvinist though the words he uses may be different if you told the modern american that he is totally depraved he would think you were joking as he himself usually is he is convinced that he always has been and always will be victorious and blameless calvinism thus lost its basis in american life some emotional natures indeed reverted in their religious revivals or private searchings of heart to the sources of the tradition for any of the radical points of view in philosophy may cease to be prevalent but none can cease to be possible other natures more sensitive to the moral and literary influences of the world preferred to abandon parts of their philosophy hoping thus to reduce the distance which should separate the remainder from real life meantime if anybody arose with a special sensibility or a technical genius he was in great straits not being fed sufficiently by the world he was driven in upon his own resources the three american writers whose personal endowment was perhaps the finest poe hawthorne and emerson had all a certain starved and abstract quality they could not retail the genteel tradition they were too keen too perceptive and too independent for that but life offered them little digestible material nor were they naturally voracious they were fastidious and under the circumstances they were starved emerson to be sure fed on books there was a great catholicity in his reading and he showed a fine tact in his comments and in his way of appropriating what he read but he read transcendentally not historically to learn what he himself felt not what others might have felt before him and to feed on books for a philosopher or a poet is still to starve books can help him to acquire form or to avoid pitfalls they cannot supply him with substance if he is to have any therefore the genius of poe and hawthorne and even of emerson was employed on a sort of inner play or digestion of vacancy it was a refined labour but it was in danger of being morbid or tinkling or self-indulgent it was a play of intramental rhymes their mind was like an old music-box full of tender echoes and quaint fancies these fancies expressed their personal genius sincerely as dreams may but they were arbitrary fancies in comparison with what a real observer would have said in the premises their manner in a word was subjective in their own persons they escaped the mediocrity of the genteel tradition but they supplied nothing to supplant it in other minds the churches likewise although they modified their spirit had no philosophy to offer save a new emphasis on parts of what calvinism contained the theology of calvin we must remember had much in it besides philosophical calvinism a christian tenderness and a hope of grace for the individual came to mitigate its sardonic optimism and it was these evangelical elements that the calvinistic churches now emphasized seldom and with blushes referring to hell-fire or infant damnation yet philosophic calvinism with a theory of life that would perfectly justify hell-fire and infant damnation if they happen to exist still dominates the traditional metaphysics it is an ingredient and the decisive ingredient in what calls itself idealism but in order to see just what part calvinism plays in current idealism it will be necessary to distinguish the other chief element in that complex system namely transcendentalism transcendentalism is the philosophy which the romantic era produced in germany and independently i believe in america also transcendentalism proper like romanticism is not any particular set of dogmas about what things exist it is not a system of the universe regarded as a fact or as a collection of facts it is a method a point of view from which any world no matter what it might contain could be approached by a self-conscious observer transcendentalism is systematic subjectivism it studies the perspectives of knowledge as they radiate from the self 
it is a plan of those avenues of inference by which our ideas of things must be reached if they are to afford any systematic or distant vistas in other words transcendentalism is the critical logic of science knowledge it says has a station as in a watch-tower it is always seated here and now in the self of the moment the past and the future things inferred and things conceived lie around it painted as upon a panorama they cannot be lighted up save by some centrifugal ray of attention and present interest by some active operation of the mind this is hardly the occasion for developing or explaining this delicate insight suffice it to say lest you should think later that i disparage transcendentalism that as a method i regard it as correct and when once suggested unforgettable i regard it as the chief contribution made in modern times to speculation but it is a method only an attitude we may always assume if we like and that will always be legitimate it is no answer it involves no particular answer to the question what exists in what order is what exists produced what is to exist in the future this question must be answered by observing the object and tracing humbly the movement of the object it cannot be answered at all by harping on the fact that this object if discovered must be discovered by somebody and by somebody who has an interest in discovering it yet the germans who first gained the full transcendental insight were romantic people they were more or less frankly poets they were colossal egotists and wished to make not only their own knowledge but the whole universe centre about themselves and full as they were of their romantic isolation and romantic liberty it occurred to them to imagine that all reality might be a transcendental self and a romantic dreamer like themselves nay that it might be just their own transcendental self and their own romantic dreams extended indefinitely transcendental logic the method of discovery for the mind was to become also the method of evolution in nature and history transcendental methods so abused produce transcendental myth a conscientious critique of knowledge was turned into a sham system of nature we must therefore distinguish sharply the transcendental grammar of the intellect which is significant and potentially correct from the various transcendental systems of the universe which are chimeras in both its parts however transcendentalism had much to recommend it to american philosophers for the transcendental method appealed to the individualistic and revolutionary temper of their youth while transcendental myths enabled them to find a new status for their inherited theology and to give what parts of it they cared to preserve some semblance of philosophical backing this last was the use to which the transcendental method was put by kant himself who first brought it into vogue before the terrible weapon had got out of hand and become the instrument of pure romanticism kant came he himself said to remove knowledge in order to make room for faith which in his case meant faith in calvinism in other words he applied the transcendental method to matters of fact reducing them thereby to human ideas in order to give to the calvinistic postulates of conscience a metaphysical validity for kant had a genteel tradition of his own which he wished to remove to a place of safety feeling that the empirical world had become too hot for it and this place of safety was the region of transcendental myth i need hardly say how perfectly this expedient suited the needs of philosophers in america and it is no accident if the influence of kant soon became dominant here to embrace this philosophy was regarded as a sign of profound metaphysical insight although the most mediocre minds found no difficulty in embracing it in truth it was a sign of having been brought up in the genteel tradition of feeling it weak and of wishing to save it but the transcendental method in its way was also sympathetic to the american mind it embodied in a radical form the spirit of protestantism as distinguished from its inherited doctrines it was autonomous undismayed calmly revolutionary it felt that will was deeper than intellect it focused everything here and now and asked all things to show their credentials at the bar of the young self and to prove their value for this latest born moment these things are truly american 
they would be characteristic of any young society with a keen and discursive intelligence and they are strikingly exemplified in the thought and in the person of emerson they constitute what he called self-trust self-trust like other transcendental attitudes may be expressed in metaphysical fables the romantic spirit may imagine itself to be an absolute force evoking and moulding the plastic world to express its varying moods but for a pioneer who is actually a world-builder this metaphysical illusion has a partial warrant in historical fact far more warrant than it could boast of in the fixed and articulated society of europe among the moonstruck rebels and sulking poets of the romantic era emerson was a shrewd yankee by instinct on the winning side he was a cheery childlike soul impervious to the evidence of evil as of everything that did not suit his transcendental individuality to appreciate or to notice more perhaps than anybody that has ever lived he practised the transcendental method in all its purity he had no system he opened his eyes on the world every morning with a fresh sincerity marking how things seemed to him then or what they suggested to his spontaneous fancy this fancy for being spontaneous was not always novel it was guided by the habits and training of his mind which were those of a preacher yet he never insisted on his notions so as to turn them into settled dogmas he felt in his bones that they were myths sometimes indeed the bad example of other transcendentalists less true than he to their method or the pressing questions of unintelligent people or the instinct we all have to think our ideas final led him to the very verge of system-making but he stopped short had he made a system out of his notion of compensation or the oversoul or spiritual laws the result would have been as thin and forced as it is in other transcendental systems but he coveted truth and he returned to experience to history to poetry to the natural science of his day for new starting points and hints toward fresh transcendental musings to covet truth is a very distinguished passion every philosopher says he is pursuing the truth but this is seldom the case as mr bertrand russell has observed one reason why philosophers often fail to reach the truth is that often they do not desire to reach it those who are genuinely concerned in discovering what happens to be true are rather the men of science the naturalists the historians and ordinarily they discover it according to their lights the truths they find are never complete and are not always important but they are integral parts of the truth facts and circumstances that help to fill in the picture and that no later interpretation can invalidate or afford to contradict but professional philosophers are usually only apologists that is they are absorbed in defending some vested illusion or some eloquent idea like lawyers or detectives they study the case for which they are retained to see how much evidence or semblance of evidence they can gather for the defence and how much prejudice they can raise against the witnesses for the prosecution for they know they are defending prisoners suspected by the world and perhaps by their own good sense of falsification they do not covet truth but victory and the dispelling of their own doubts what they defend is some system that is some view about the totality of things of which men are actually ignorant no system would have ever been framed if people had been simply interested in knowing what is true whatever it may be what produces systems is the interest in maintaining against all comers that some favourite or inherited idea of ours is sufficient and right a system may contain an account of many things which in detail are true enough but as a system covering infinite possibilities that neither our experience nor our logic can prejudge it must be a work of imagination and a piece of human soliloquy it may be expressive of human experience it may be poetical but how should any one who really coveted truth suppose that it was true emerson had no system and his coveting truth had another exceptional consequence he was detached unworldly contemplative when he came out of the conventicle or the reform meeting or out of the rapturous close atmosphere of the lecture-room he heard nature whispering to him why so hot little sir no doubt the spirit or energy of the world is what is acting in us as the sea is what rises in every little wave but it passes through us and cry out as we may 
it will move on our privilege is to have perceived it as it moves our dignity is not in what we do but in what we understand the whole world is doing things we are turning in that vortex yet within us is silent observation the speculative eye before which all passes which bridges the distances and compares the combatants on this side of his genius emerson broke away from all conditions of age or country and represented nothing except intelligence itself end of chapter six part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine